Oh, I think we're live. Are we live? We are. <coughs> Welcome everybody in the audience and on the web. Um, we're thrilled and excited to start this conversation, which is probably the most conversations conversation you've been having in the last month. Um, but you're definitely the most important conversation we're having at the Horasis Asia meeting in this year, namely the question of how do we leverage technology for social impact? And we have this little across Asia in there. Um, I, I'm honored and delighted to have, um, have a panel here that brings together expertise, um, great expertise from from very different perspectives and so we're going to try to have a fast and furious panel where we bring all that expertise in and together um let me start with um with yonka who's on my right um she's the co-founder and chief executive of impact shakers in portugal we have tim kobe um i think it's still very early in the morning for you right um wherever you That's are right. <laughs> I'm in Hawaii. Um, he's he's the CEO of Eight Inc. Um, we have um, Stephen Clement. No, Stephen's not here yet. Stephen's coming. Uh, Clementic from Ankara. We have Michelle Mosca, um, the co-founder and president of Evolution Q in Canada. Still also dark outside, I assume, right? And we have Tuan. One, I'm killing your name here. I'm slaughtering your name. Um, um, he's the CEO of the Boston Global Forum, and I assume you're in Boston. Yes. So also crazy early, so yes. um, or crazy late, or whatever you want to say. So <laughs> delighted to have you all here. Um, for me, it's midday. Um, um, I'm in Munich, Germany. It's snowing outside, and. Um, I just come from from a meeting with the um, um, with an um, um, minister who also said leveraging technology in order to move Indonesia to the next level is is what we need to do. And so in this panel, we're actually going to find out how to do that. Um, so let me start with the very first questions. What are examples from your own experience, from your work? where technology has made a difference in the society you're working on. And um, let's take this one as a rapid fire question and we'll have questions where we'll, we'll pick and choose individuals or you just raise your hand. But on this one, I, I think we need all of your experience. So maybe um, Yonka, starting with you. Hello, uh, thanks for the introduction, Philip. Um, so, when I was thinking about this question, uh, the first thing that came to mind for me was uh, Femtech, which is the technology um, on female health. And I find it incredible. It is your society. So it's not particularly my society alone, but this is a technology that impacts half of our world population. But it has been um, rather neglected for a very long time. And I think Femtech shows very well the potential of technology and the impact it can have um, on neglected problems. Like um, in this case, there have been new solutions, more new solutions over the past five years than in ever for menopause, menstruational pains, uh, hormonal balances of women. So when you ask me this question, I would like to refer to Femtech. And thank you for giving examples because because it's it is a topic we haven't we haven't thought of through well enough yet and bringing it into the we'll come back to that. Tim, how about you? Um, yeah, I, I would say that um, you know there have been many many things that have impacted society in the past, but if we look at going forward. I would say the way we define technology is very important to consider uh, from the standpoint that we often confuse a technical capability with that of technology. And technology really needs to have a purpose if it's going to create value and ultimately if it's going to impact humanity in a, in a positive way. 
And I think it's important to distinguish between a technical capability and actually the purpose or the or the the value that the technology is creating. Without that, I don't think we really have technology. Tim, you speak out of my heart because um, so 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 the distinction between techne, um, the Greek techne, and the logos, so the meaning, where the the goal we actually want to go go for. But mm. pushing pushing you a bit further, um, what what tech techne logos has changed um, in your own experience um, the world, or is in the process of changing the world, just as femtech is doing it for um, for Yonka. Well, we're in our 24 year, 24th year working with Apple. So obviously the, the iPhone, the fact that everybody today has a computer in their pocket, a pretty powerful one, um, is something that you couldn't have said uh, in any other lifetime, I suppose. And I think in terms of having impact, both potentially positive and negative, um, we're learning about a new tool and how best to incorporate that in, uh, to, the, you know, to the greatest benefit. And tools can do good or bad. Um, but let's move on to um, Tuan. Yes. Hi. Uh, we are really focused on technology. We use, uh, in Boston Global Forum, we use uh, AI, blockchain, digital technology to build new model for new society. That is AI or society. And we uh, do with our... Uh, with, um, uh, the United Nations uh, to develop and create um, initiative, uh, the United Nations Centennial Initiative, uh, and uh, publish the book "Remaking the World to What an Edge of Global Enlightenment." That means all concepts of technology to improve, to make the world better and society better. That is that we focus very much in using AI blockchain digital to improve politics and society <clears throat> wow and that's a that's a big big one um, um because with ai we also we know the good and the bad and the ugly um and and using it for enlightenment process i know we want to go down that brain but michelle um to you yeah yeah michele it's, uh, michele i'm yeah. sorry it's a, but you look so <laughs> french or so or <laughs> but yeah <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll give an example at both levels, you know, both interpretations of technology. I got into cryptography back in the 90s before uh, we had a lot of the digital, plat almost any of the digital platforms we take for granted today. And so cryptography is a great enabler, uh, especially the way it's deployed now where you don't need to be a cryptographer to have it and use it, right? So it enables integrity, uh, like the auto updates we rely on every day, but that wouldn't work without cryptography, right? Because then it would just be holding malware, basically, right? And you wouldn't know who you're talking to and so on. And you couldn't, where necessary, have a confidential uh, you know, discussion. But even the company, but it's an enabler because without the integrity and uh, with IoT, because connecting something to the internet, are you crazy? Like, uh, how do you know that a bad person is going to take it over, right? And the only reason they can't so easily is because of the cryptography. Uh, so an example of what cryptography has enabled, because it enables essentially all of our digital platforms, but just with this kind of call today, can you imagine when, this, when I was a child, like having a phone call to Europe was a big deal, right? And it was on a phone and it was one-to-one -one and it was expensive. Uh, you couldn't see the person, that's for sure. And now for very, very, again, I realize there's still people who can't afford to even have a, a Zoom call or a FaceTime or whatever, but all, like a huge fraction of the population now can reach out and talk to anyone across the planet and can get access to information. Again, in a way that now we just take for granted, but we didn't have that even when, you know, certainly when I was even in university, um, uh, definitely not as a child. So that's a, a big, you know, has had many positive impacts, had negative ones too. But I think uh, definitely excited with all the positive things it has enabled. I wonder how how one measures these things, and and maybe maybe one of you has an answer there because because again, I mean, like like you you've I've had that experience as a kid. I spent 
spend time in guest families in the United States and um, and of course was cut off from my parents in those six weeks or so there there was maybe one call um, that I could 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 do to call home and that was a three minute call or so because that's what you paid for you paid for three minute chunks of um, but how how do we how do we because we normally talk mainly about the downside of social media and the the impact social media for example has on on our the negative impact it has on our kids but like on all the beautiful things has any one of you worked on that as an opinion opinion on that how we measure the the beauty that comes from 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 technology and 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 using technology to just connect humans with each other the we've had a lot of um we've had um several guest students from Colombia here and the way they were able to just like live their or experience their life in Germany the snow or so and then share it with their families in Colombia was 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 were incredible moments where i i sometimes feel we um we don't don't point enough at these at these things so i don't know um um anyone any good answers on that one i see tim smiling um No, I, I, I'm, I'm smiling because um, I, I have six children. So um, in terms of staying in touch with them and uh, the communication and sharing some moments that might otherwise uh, be lost uh, together, uh, the technology certainly has. How we measure, how we measure it is a question. Um, I think it, it comes down to, in many cases, the personal relationships uh, that that we manage and are able to develop. Um, so I don't, I don't know if there's a quantifiable statistic. I'm not aware of it, but um, maybe maybe that's where the happiness factor comes in. Yeah. And it's surprising, right? We haven't, as a world, we haven't become much happier in the last three years, even though we should have. Um, so I wonder if happiness is a relative good or and we we actually are happier in moments or not i don't know um maybe let's not go down that road and and let's move back to to what you guys do and um and 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 how we can figure out this question of leveraging technology for social impact um what's your if you if you think about and and you all work in this space and and i think yonka you 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 touched my heart with the with the with the femtech um, aspect, and maybe you can allude a bit on that. Um, what's your model? How how we use technology to 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 innovate and then to leverage that for social impact? How do you think well, about how, that? How we work at Impact Shakers is that um, we start from diversity. We start from diversity of thoughts, diversity of backgrounds, and uh, we believe that entrepreneurship um, and social entrepreneurship or impact entrepreneurship, as we say, is a fantastic vehicle to offer solutions to complex problems. Um, but we're not stepping into all of the problem-solving potential there is in the world because entrepreneurs still look very much alike. They come from very similar backgrounds. So we work on having these overlooked founders come up with new ideas and um, new solutions with technology. Because I don't think there are many solutions which do not have a technology component within them. Um, but that's a different road to go <laughs> down into. Um, but we start from um, diversity. And do you do that in Portugal or do you do that globally, virtually? We, we do it global. Uh, globally. We have a global community. We have local programming. Um, so we do have, we, we work from ID stage to scale. So some of our programs are very local, um, but our most important programs right now are in Europe. But the next region will um, start activities in is Southeast Asia. Very cool. And do you already have some successes you can talk about? Well, we've, um, so what we're really excited about is the intersection of this diversity of founders and fundraising. So um, we're working on innovative financing vehicles 
because we believe that venture capital um, is definitely only suited for certain types of businesses and we need many more types of um, financing for diversity of founders, but diversity of ideas as well, and especially in impact. Um, so we've ran a program called Raise Alternative Funding for Your Impact Business, which was the first of its kind. And uh, we had 42 businesses in there last year, and they've already raised over 13 million together um, in alternative financing, so not in venture capital. Super cool. Let's move to a more, um, or I assume, let's let's see where where the conversation goes, but to a more um, 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 technological-minded framework. Um, Tuan, what's what's your model? How do you how do you, you see this? Yes, uh, thank you. We um, do very much for us. I thought that uh, we do AI society. That is the new model, new uh, society with the uh, deeply applied for technology of AI, digital blockchain. And uh, we are uh, developed that is uh, remaking the world to what an age of global enlightenment, that is a new enlightenment age to uh, with the uh, AI technology and how to make that better and manage and governance that is a bad side. And um, we have a uh, space, uh, that model we do, the social contract for GAIH. And um, we developed recently with the uh, conference with the uh, World Leadership Alliance Club de Marit, that is AI, World, uh, AI, International AI Accord, uh, and um, also global law on AI, and uh, special for every people we develop. Uh, platform AI WS city that every citizen, every people can become innovator. We build platform with uh, AI and uh, blockchain for every citizen can have digital home, can have platform to create the, their uh, own work and uh, business and they become innovator. We try to reach out and support for it changed the innovation work. And that is the, we name uh, community innovation economy. That, that is a new model in economy by apply AI and blockchain. So you provide the philosoph the philosophical framework. Yes. And um, and the and the, the the platform or the community for for people interested in changing the world through AI and and um, blockchain. Wow, um, Michele and Tim, add add to the conversation. So now we've had the funders and the and the knowledge transfer from Yonka. We've had the philosophers from Tuan. What can you add to the debate here? I don't. I would. I don't know if I have a model I would articulate right now. So maybe I'll save my time for uh, the other questions. It's a great question. I, I I would just add that that you know for for any of these models, and I do think it it's it's um, looking at at ultimately how are we creating value that you need to have a model that's targeting human outcomes first. Um, it's great to have AI or blockchain or any other technology, but many times as because of the way we're wired, the way we're educated, we tend to focus on the tactics first. And I think it's very important from a model standpoint to look at human outcomes first, form a strategy that delivers on those outcomes, and then ultimately the tactics you need for the strategy to work. Um, and, it, and it's commonly the inverse of the way many of the people that we work with approach a problem. So it's, it's important, I think, to, to look at the development around those outcomes. And those outcomes have to include a positive uh, natural environment outcome as well, uh, or we don't, we don't have much of a world to live in. So it's important, it's important to, I think, structure our approach to, to technology in that way. Yes, I fully agree with Tim that we do very much for that. That is for human being first, 
uh, technology support and help and uh, make uh, people better in and also we have AI ethics and uh, also social contract for GIH that is for that for human being for maintain our common value standard values that is the uh, that is the democratic value in AI and uh, digital and blockchain and um, we make that is the international relation standards between governments to governments by that is the ZIT standard from the social contract for the IH that we name that is TCPIP to connect between governments between countries because now internet we have TCPIP protocol to access to uh, communicate between the internet users but between each government now we don't have standard about values and uh, stand uh, for our democracy to support for to maintain relation so it is a very uh, much we do for that and i fully agree and uh, great thank for team comment yeah what well, we it, it, it what we do in, in in my little company is we we call it working backwards from the customer and essentially what we mean there and i think it very much relates to what you're you're saying um both of you are saying is you start with something we we call we write a press release first we don't think about the technology at all but we we think of the end state that we want to generate um with the customer and then start with a customer quote in there and then write like a like a like a document that you would send out to journalists as a as a press release um on whatever we've solved this and that and that um um we we've we've now enabled kids to go to school when even on days when they cannot go go to to the classroom or so and and then not talk about the the technology and then develop the technologies um afterwards so i think that goes a bit in in that direction but so in if I could, Kelly, yeah. Go back to basically what Tim uh, said made me think because I mean, if it's what how things should interact and should be done, I think an important that facet that you've kind of implicitly touched on, like when you said, how can we measure, you know, these impacts and so on, and 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 Yoncha's work as well, like um, we have to understand it and somehow be accountable for all the impacts, right? And so if there's too many sort of externalities. And we just focus on uh, some part of it. Uh, eventually, those externalities will be internalized with, with some very negative consequences. So, uh, you know, with anything new and exciting is is deployed, you have to really understand the risks as well and make sure they're properly mitigated and not just hide them and ignore them, <clears throat> push them off, or make them someone else's problem. Uh, identify obvious moral hazards and and, and, and account for that. Uh, and, and the impact is kind of the reverse in that you have to somehow reward positive impacts, right? Uh, that sometimes we don't have a, you know, the current investment mechanisms don't really uh, do. And so we don't incentivize the things we want. We don't, de you know, disincentivize the things we don't want. So I think those need to be more accurately captured in, in our models because we'll pay for it eventually. We're just accruing this immense debt uh, when we don't do it, you know, more upfront. And Michele, let me push you a bit on that. It seems that in in the tech space, um, because we still think we're so young and it's it's such a new space, we we think we're not so important, I guess sometimes, or we don't think of those consequences often. Um, um, we in 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 my company, we 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 work on principle base on principles, leadership principles is what they call they're called there. And we, we just recently have installed a new one or started a new, um, which tries to get at that. And, and that's our way of trying to deal with what the sentiment where we, we said we started out in a garage, but we're not there anymore. We're big, we impact the world and are far from perfect. And, um, we must be humble and thoughtful and about even the secondary effects of our actions. And I think the secondary effects of our actions is, is what you're, you're talking about there also. Um, so if if you start a social media business where you say I want to connect the world so that they'll be friendlier to each other, and then you figure out well you also generate these echo chamber echo chambers that lead to bad things, um, that's hard 
um, I think that's really hard work. That's work, and that's something we need to think about. And um, but segging into and into maybe a very practical um, question, um, because we've been confronted with what technology, the good technology, can do, and and also its limits um, in the COVID crisis, right? I mean, if if we would not have had the types of if, if this if the COVID crisis would have hit our planet ten years earlier. Um, mm -hmm. I like. I mean, the global economy probably would have melted down to, to 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 levels we've not seen since since whatever um, the 16th century or so. Um, and so, because of technology, I think we're able to keep things up. But of course, it also had unintended consequences. So, if you again, all of you reflect on that, and maybe 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 at this time, not starting with Yonka, but starting with Michaela, because we started with Yonka before. Um, is um, what have you learned from COVID and um, where has technology surprised you and where think, was it really not as good as it could have been? Yeah, well, I mean, I think what we as a society, we viscerally learned, because I think logically we've always known this, is the consequences of not being prepared for something. And now, obviously there's the unknown unknowns, but pandemics, like viruses, we know about that. We've known they happen every few decades, and and we used to have mechanisms after SARS that were a lot much better at detecting and getting ahead of it, and we just let our guard down. And and now we're in a special age where there's a bit of you know the amnesia bias hasn't kicked in yet, so we might be able to be a little more proactive and design more resilience into our society and our systems and so on. And the example, like what I work on, is. So you're totally right. Like one of the big things that really made this not nearly as bad as it could have been, and it was bad, it's bad, but it could have been a heck of a lot worse is because of our all these digital platforms that allow us to still keep working and stay connected. Those are tremendously vulnerable. Like it's just a ticking time bomb for systemic collapse of our digital infrastructures. Uh, so I, my work is to try to make our digital platforms, our cyber systems much more resilient. My specific, the specific attacks I'm worried about are the quantum enabled attacks, but it's really the same recipe for, uh, or similar recipe for all the other potential unknowns. So I'm, you know, tremendously concerned about, like, what if there was a massive cyber attack on our digital platforms now of all times, when it's, it's our sort of our last, you know, it, it's, it's especially more critical now because there isn't the, just, well, now it's again, imagine 12 months ago. It wasn't so easy. We'll just go there in person. Uh, not, not so easy. So, uh, but so on a positive side, it was really amazing that even though we hadn't really prepared from a massive global work from home, uh, you know, campaign that we had, things actually worked. Like not perfectly, but internet, you know, things didn't crash because of massive changes in bandwidth. Uh, you know, how it's where and, and the volume. So things did. So I mean, that kind of I'm glad we were as resilient as we were from that perspective, but we're not that resilient. I am, uh, you know, it has highlighted our vulnerability. And I think hopefully we realize it really wouldn't have cost us that much to be ready, right? Like people say, oh, so many billion dollars to prepare for a pandemic. How many trillions <clears throat> did it cost the world? I don't know how any economic model where it wouldn't have been a good idea to be a little more prepared than we were today. I've, I've had this horrible exper experience looking back and I was at the Munich Security Conference in, in, in February of, of 2020 and um, spent spend several minutes talking to Dr. Tedros, the head of the WHO at that time. And, and we were all not taking this so serious yet. And he was like, we just gained a month because the Chinese actually locked down everything. We have, if we now get the world under control, we have a chance. And he was just like moving around and trying to tell this to everyone and anyone. And boy, no, I mean, boy, was he right. And boy, did we not listen, um, at that time. Um, but I think we've lost Tim somehow. Tim, are you still there or no? Gone and Yonka, you're on mute. So we have Tim lost and Yonka's on mute. But <laughs> yes, so I wasn't talking <laughs> except for saying Tim is gone. <laughs> um, so uh, when when I think about the the surprises, I think on the one hand I'm very surprised that our supply chains are still so fragile. Mm -hmm. Um, 
to me that was surprising and still is surprising that the price of construction materials have skyrocketed by now. Um, so that's on the bad end. And then on the good end, the mRNA vaccine, that's fantastic. It's, it's fantastic that this technology they've been working on for so long now got this acceleration and I'm very happy to have one of them in me. <laughs> um, and I'm very excited about those advancements that, that have gone through this incredible acceleration. Wow, that's yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's amazing. It's it's amazing to ask this question. What would have happened if the crisis was ten years before, right? Because I mean, we're using all these technologies that are just available right now, and they would not have been if whatever. Take the two thousand and three R um, SARS SARS crisis, uh, bird flu crisis. If what would have happened if that would have gone global at that point? Um, um, and it did not. So, so yes, we, we knew about these things, but boy, we had some fantastic things. Um, Tuan, to you. Yes. Uh, I, uh, with, uh, last year, you know, uh, COVID, so they changed the world and AI, WS, uh, AI World Society and Boston Global Forum, we see a new, uh, opportunity and a need for society that is, uh, the people, every people will work more in virtual, in internet and online uh, environment. And we create ecosystem for that, that is AI, WS city, that is the people can live here with virtual and uh, work together. So that means we see that is a new demand, a new need for every people. And that means we have new initiative an um, AI WS city. And uh, that is a big uh, surprise, but very good for the people. We always think that the, with any challenge, threat, new challenge, new threat, that we have to see a uh, solution. Um, and uh, that is that we have solution to, for, to do that. But not only technology at AI, blockchain, we need biotechnology, medical system, something like that to solve that issue. And that means we have collaborate together. And uh, yes, I see, uh, we see that uh, optimistic uh, human being and our global community to collaborate using technology as AI, data science, blockchain, digital, and uh, uh, biotechnology to uh, show any issue, yes, any issue. But as team talk, and now as we do, that is uh, based on human being, based on democratic values and uh, standards, because of the world now, with technology, we need standard and governance for that. That is uh, our work, and I'm um, really impressive with uh, the world today. But we don't, many people uh, worry and uh, criticize situation, something like that. But as uh, our have knowledge, have uh, technology, we need to see and to create solution. And uh, we try to collaborate. Why not you and our panelists today, we know each other and we collaborate together to bring new solution and better solution for the world. Yes. Thank you. Now there are two more things I want to drive at. And so, so um, I ask all of you to be as succinct as possible. Um, um, and um, um, at, at, in parallel, Tim is trying to get back into the panel, but the, somehow the thing, the technology is asking for a password and, um, um, and, we're not letting him in. I think, Michaela, that must have been your crypto approach here. Yeah. Um, um, you're securing our panel. Um, here, yeah. <laughs> um, now, 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 here's here's a question because we do have different cultures on this panel here, and it's it's something I've been wondering about. Is and Tim, in a way, alluded to it when he talked about techne and logos. Um, um, so the 
the the interplay of um, techniques with um, or te- with with um, thinking, and and that's where culture is not far. Does culture impact the relationship in how we use technology, um, or not? Is technology a lingua franca for humanity? I guess could be the question. You, you know, uh, Michaela, you want to go, right? But uh, Hold on, yes. you're asking me. I'm very happy. If I am asking you. you. Yes, I am. You are asking. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I don't know, but I, so at that sort of fundamental level, you're asking. I mean, the answer is probably yes. It's really hard to just just compartmentalize these sorts of things. Um, most of our decision making is emotional, and and I mean I, I don't know how you can separate. Um, and, you know, there's certainly you know, you know culture and all these things will interplay. But in terms of Asia, because I think the question or you know, is aimed at um, how are things maybe different? How does this? How is it different in Asia? Or what do we see in Asia? And most of my experience in Asia, I mean, is in a few countries, mostly Singapore, some Japan and Korea, a small country, and they're all different, right? And, and even if maybe there are some common threads. And Singapore is a small country, so I don't know if you'd call it a culture, but maybe it is. So being small, um, there's a tendency to be able to get things done. Uh, and they also, in Singapore, you know, it's not like their economy is... is fueled by natural resources, right? Like they, they really have to be wise and, and effective and get things done, right? Or else there's not much of a, you know, uh, anything else to fall back on. So I, I find, you know, they're, and again, given the size, they're able to get all the stakeholders together across the broad spectrum of the country, uh, make a decision and execute, right? Uh, and that's kind of harder in the larger scales, but we need to, I think, get better at doing that. And maybe technology can help us do that. And not an easy thing to do. But imagine we can actually get all the stakeholders together in a room. We could probably tackle a lot more of the human challenges instead of, because, you know, what happens is everybody tries to optimize what they get and, and, and you know, increase what, you know, their inputs, the, the amount of money they get or whatever, and pull off all the costs to other people. It's easy to do when they're not in the room and you can, can kind of get away with it. It's a lot harder to do that when you're looking them in the face and, and, and so on. So I don't know if there's a way to scale that, that ability to kind of get get everyone in the room, uh, make a decision for the common good, and then execute. That would be great. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I think a uh, uh, great question. Uh, I think the mutual uh, interact between culture and technology uh, uh, we, um, I'm Vietnamese. I was from Vietnam, and I moved to Boston work to work here. And uh, I think two culture, Vietnamese culture and the U.S. culture, maybe have something common culture. That means uh, would like to discover and explore new things very much and apply new technology very much. So that is a very good to. Uh, for, for technology, to apply new technology, to build new things, new society. By that way, we have new model AI or society. That is from culture, Vietnamese and the US. But uh, we think also technology can support and make new culture. And uh, you can see that is AI or society and uh, with a new uh, enlightenment age, global enlightenment age. So that means not only innovation, not only economy, but also that is culture. That is will create new culture. In Europe do great things with the, for culture in uh, enlightenment age in 18th century with the great things and uh, now also with AI blockchain and digital new technology, we build new society, new that is the, the age of global enlightenment. We will build new culture and we we'll create new culture in this 21st century. And the most important after the culture for support and health, uh, leverage 
human being and better in ethics and moral for human and very good because uh, you can see uh, with technology we can see every leaders or people they honest or dishonest <laughs> they say you can easy to check and we can easy to check that is the, what is a, a written uh, statement good or not or uh, right or wrong because uh, we have data we can uh, <coughs> develop and can uh, can use the data to check and that means new culture the people need to more honest between think say and work that is the new culture and uh, i hope new culture uh, the, the ai or society culture will make the world more human human being more uh, tolerance more uh, compassionate compassionate that is the new culture for new society and all of us together because a culture not from any people from community and uh, but with the uh, pioneering people and leading people we can apply technology to make new culture yeah thank you now yonka bring it all together for us <laughs> well i i wanted to add some ideas but after tuan's speech i want to keep it optimistic because you have such a beautiful and optimistic view of uh, what technology can do for humans and for global culture that i will leave it at that <laughs> Now that in principle is a beautiful last word but it's not how we're doing this because we have 3 minutes and we're going to use those 3 minutes those 3 minutes belong to each of you like um now we we were already going on to that on to the, the the question of how do we move from leveraging technology for social impact in Asia across Asia to leveraging technology to build a beautiful new humanity or a new enlightenment age um so riff of that yonka first um twan second and michela cut off and each of you has 32 seconds okay um what i've been thinking about lately is how much impact standards have on what gets built and what gets implemented like at the cop 26 how they um set the new standards for IFRS climate accounting um so i think there is a big key in there in including more different profiles in setting those type of standards because the impact is incredible hmm. just um, <clears throat> we do like to apply and work together with the uh, asia cities as uh, uh, some vietnamese uh, uh, nha trang uh, hanoi saigon or in uh, tokyo and uh, japan uh, that is asia city to do that is the flagship cities in the edge of global enlightenment and uh, also connecting between boston and asia cities to do that why not and also of course with european cities have great deep culture and uh, national so we would like to work together to make and to build between a university and a university in european in europe for flagship city in the edge of global enlightenment that is our work michael yeah. cities and you yeah i mean before the covid amnesia bias kicks in let's take advantage of of what we now know and recognize our interdependence start recognizing various debts that we kind of bury because it's convenient whether it's you know social injustice debt or environmental debt or technology debt um and start factoring those into our short term decision making and let's develop new culture new habits that we take forward uh and build a better you know, world for everyone there's nothing to add thank you very very much um this was the most beautiful panel i think that we've had at this year's horizons asia meeting and i think moving forward we will 
get there, I hope. And I'm at least much more hopeful now than I was when I got into the state today. Um, well, I was b battling all types of sovereignty issues in European governments, and um, and I think there's beauty in, in what you guys are thinking. Thank you so, so much. It was an honor and a pleasure. And let's stay in touch. We have email. Yep. And let's wave to Tim. Poor Tim. He's fighting his way into this panel, but I think it's over now. So. Thank you, Simon Philip. You are great. You know, that's a, um, uh, early morning, but I'm very, uh, we know sleepy because you, you are wonderful moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Stay in touch. Yeah, do together. Yeah. The best one. Yeah.